because I think it's a, can you hear me out there? So can you hear me out there? Okay, there we go. Hey, was, well, good morning. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you guys made it. Um, the rest of the people, they'll probably get in. The doors are open. The heat's on. They'll probably at least feel the heat and come on in. But anyway, real quick, say we just want to thank you guys for being here this morning. Thank you for being at Plainfield Christian Church. Um, we're one of the few people that's, you know, that's still open. So we're glad that you made it. I uh, hope you guys are safe and sound and warm and know I lost power or anything crazy like that. So, yes, we're going to have a great morning. So anyway, I just want to do a couple quick announcements for you guys so you kind of know what's going on. Uh, first and foremost, maybe you saw as you were walking in, uh, there's a table out front uh, because um, today is kind of our first full day for uh, our new children's minister, Wade, um, and his wife, Maddie since he was sick last week. Uh, so today, right after the uh, morning service, there is going to be a little uh, reception for him um, for him uh, and Maddie. And so if you want to get to know them a little bit, um, then please feel free to, to stop by and, and, uh, and uh, check them out because I know that Wade would love to actually meet you guys and uh, he's, a, he's a pretty awesome person to know. So make sure that you guys stick around for that, especially if you have a child who is in, who is in fifth grade or younger. Uh, you'll definitely want to get to know him as well. So we've got that going on. Uh, next, also right out, uh, you may have saw that there is a sign-up for uh, Round Robin Dinners. Uh, round Robin Dinners are pretty fantastic, okay? Um, because what it is, is just you and four to six, maybe, maybe, like, maybe like ten other people in a small group. Uh, you guys eat, because eating is always fantastic. Um, but it really just gives you guys an opportunity uh, to get to know other people here at Plainfield, but not just get to know them, but actually develop a deeper um, 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 relationship with them. Um, so if you want to grow um, in that area, then definitely, definitely sign up for, for uh, Round Robin because you, will, you guys will definitely, definitely um, um, enjoy that as well. And then lastly, the, I think the only thing I got is, is that tonight at 6 o'clock, we have a uh, gospel uh, singing group coming in called uh, Stand as One. Okay, And uh, they are a local group from from Sparta, um, so, so if you like kind of like southern gospel music and kind of being upbeat, and um, then, be here for, then be here tonight for that, because uh, they're going to be amazing. I know they were here Thursday night doing a, kind of doing a sound check and, and uh, run through, and they did awesome, and they sounded incredible. So uh, if you want to be blessed for that, then definitely uh, come tonight. And then if you don't mind, if you do come tonight, uh, maybe bring a little cash with you, because... Um, we, we are going to do a, a love offering for them just to help pay for their expenses coming from, you know, Sparta, which isn't, isn't too far. Um, but, you know, they can still use gas money and all that fun stuff. So uh, if, if you do plan on coming tonight, just bring um, some cash just as a, as a uh, love offering from them. But anyway, we are so glad that, that you guys are here this morning. Uh, even though the weather may not be the best, um, God's still good and God is still in, um, in um, control. And uh, we are going to worship him this morning. So I'm going to pass it off to Kate. Would you stand for our call to worship? I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Let's sing together this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship. 
worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and You're slow to anger. Your name is great and Your heart is kind. For all Your goodness, I will keep on. thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. I worship Your holy. Worship your holy name. Go ahead and take a moment to greet a few of the people around you. Heidi Ho. Hi. Pardon me. Morning. for the guys half on the community. <laughs> Trust him more. 
Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus, simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. In First Chronicles, we read, Yours, Lord, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all, and this, this is the Lord that we put our trust in.
Let's pray together. Our Father, who sits on the throne, who is in control, and who is so, so worthy of our trust, you give us your assurance. You have lavishly blessed us. Sometimes in, in this very life that we live day to day, but when we think of the gift of your Son, our salvation, and our redemption, and you heap on the gift of your Spirit as well to be present in our lives each day, you have blessed us so richly. So we lay our gratitude before you this morning as we take steps toward living in active trust each day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. Amen. So, um, let me start off this um, meditation with, with, with this one truth, okay? And, and the truth is this, is that hope is certainty in the living Jesus, okay? Hope is certainty in the living Jesus. Hope is not something we want to have happen, okay? Uh, just a few weeks ago, okay, uh, we celebrated Christmas, am I right? You guys were all there, hopefully, for that. Uh, so we got together with friends and with family uh, to uh, share a meal, um, give some presents, and hopefully all of that because of Jesus. 
Um, but for as long as I can remember, uh, I remember my grandma, and you hear me right, grandma, because that's how we say it down south, uh, she would always ask me for my Christmas list, okay? And most of the time, this would happen, happen like, like that Thursday night of uh, Thanksgiving. She would ask me, like, what I wanted um, so she could go shopping right away. When she would shop, me and she would shop. Okay, and so like over the years, I would ask for like um, remote control cars, PlayStations, Xbox, you know, typical guy stuff, uh, movies, junk food, socks, you know, all that fun stuff, okay? Um, but I remember that when I gave my grandma my list, um, I hoped that I got everything that was on it, okay? And most, if not all of us, are the same way. We, we, you know, we hope to get the things that we put on our list. Um, but if we look at that, or if, if we look at our Christmas list through the definition that I gave just um, a few moments ago, um, we'll see that we really didn't have hope, but what we actually had was just uh, wishful thinking. Okay, because wishful thinking, or, or hope, as we sometimes call it, is something that we want to have happen. Okay? So, like, we want the gifts that are on our list. And sometimes, you know, we want them so badly that maybe we'll just get them. But real biblical hope is certainty in the living Jesus. Because when it comes to the gifts on our list, there's actually no certainty that we're actually going to get them. Um, but with Jesus, there is always certainty, okay? Now, you may be asking, okay, what do our Christmas list, what does this have to do with communion in the Lord's Supper? Um, well, a lot of times our, in our faith, we mistake true hope for wishful thinking. Uh, check out this verse. This is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Um, this, is, this, is, this is verse 10. Uh, Paul writes, uh, For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Okay? When we gather around this table and when we take this meal, we remember two truths. Okay? Number one is that Jesus sacrificed himself for us and for our sin. And then truth number two is that Jesus was resurrected from the grave and now sits alive at the right hand of the Father. Okay, and, so, and so every time we take this meal, we set our hope on the living Jesus. Okay, not simply going to heaven when we die. Okay, because we can be certain that Jesus is alive. Okay, we can be certain, just as Paul says uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 1 Timothy, that Jesus is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Okay, and we can be certain that since, or, or um, that since we set our hope on a living Jesus, our lives can actually be more full of joy right now. Okay, so as you take this meal, and as you live out your life this week, do so with hope, do so with joy, because we serve Jesus, Jesus who is alive. Be certain that even now, while on this planet, Jesus can actually create a little glimpse of heaven in your life and actually through us as his church. Okay, guys, we have, we have the greatest reason in the world to be hopeful. His name is Jesus, and he wants you, or, or yeah, um, or, and he wants your hope in him to be a light to the people who are around you so that ultimately they can have hope in him as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be in your house and to sing praises to you, the creator of all things. And Lord, as we gather around this table this morning as brothers and sisters in Christ, and as certain as we can hold these emblems in our hands and, and taste them and feel them, we can be just as certain of the hope we have in you. Lord, we thank you for that salvation through Jesus shed body, and his shed blood. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you for all gifts, in particular the, the gift of salvation through Jesus. We 
pray that you'll put it on our hearts to share that good news to those around us, uh, people we love, and um, we pray that we will give gifts with a cheerful heart and um, that it will also help the, the spreading of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. your heart be troubled. His tender words I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fear. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free.
Thank you, Katie, Dan, and Emily on the piano. I love that song. Just as a reminder for all you scragglers that come in, don't hear Brady's announcement. Uh, the the doohickey out there in the in the lobby with the tables and the we're having a uh, welcome to Plainfield Wade and Maddie Harrier occasion, and uh, he's uh, our, our new children's minister. We are excited to have him here. I want to give all of you a chance to uh, to meet him because. Um, like most of our children's ministers, they're in the back. We don't really see them. Um, so we're going to bring him out of there and give you a chance to uh, introduce yourself. Some of you uh, will remember him. Uh, he was uh, about uh, this high when he started coming. And uh, he was one that cried outside the door all the time, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He, he was like some of you guys that just cried because they had to come to church. And, uh, but you all got over it, and so did Wade. And uh, so we're real happy that he's here. And um, make sure and take an opportunity to stop and, uh, and meet him and greet him and his lovely wife, Maddie. And uh, the little boy, Ben, will probably be around there somewhere. Um. I know some of you are wondering, and you just keep asking and asking and asking. Uh, Jeannie is doing much better. She went to the doctor this week, um, and uh, he was happy with uh, uh, her levels and all of that uh, medical stuff. He just said, uh, stay away from, uh, not church, he meant stay away from people um, for a, a couple of weeks yet, because uh, you guys are all just sickos, and... Uh, uh, she doesn't. Uh, she doesn't need that. So, um, she's uh, she's not here this morning. But uh, thinking of us, and uh, I had two uh, texts uh, last night. I was uh, asleep, and um, it just cracks me up. People uh, texted me, and they said, uh, "Bruce, we just finished listening to January fifth's sermon." Tell us how Jeannie's doing. And see, when I talk about everything, people are listening, and so they get the whole scoop on you guys, so you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. Because you might end up in a sermon, and then everybody, even Hawaii, is going to know about it. Okay. I know I'm preaching to the choir in this thing because only super Christians would come in this kind of weather. <laughs> but I do want to tell you that even though you probably don't need this, I think we all need this encouragement and this little rah-rah uh, 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 when it comes to giving because um, things happen in our life and, uh, and we're just, you know... We, we need this reminder, and, and this is a great uh, sermon today. That's why I entitled it uh, Tithe, If You Love Jesus, Anybody Can Honk. Remember those old bumper stickers? Yeah, it doesn't take much. There's a lot more to being a Christian than just honking as you go by. So uh, let's have a, a, a prayer, and then we'll get into it. Father God, we're grateful today for the opportunity to be in your presence this is a, an area of our life that constantly is put in jeopardy. So many things that call for our money, that call for our time and call for our talent, and to be good stewards of what you have blessed us with is something that we need to keep close tabs on. So this morning I pray that as we sit here and listen, we would invite your Holy Spirit to come in and speak to us so that we might hear you, not me. And as you explain the principles, the concepts, and the assurances, 
we might not only be cheerful givers, but generous in all that we have for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. A wealthy older gentleman just recently uh, married this beautiful uh, uh, younger gal. And he was beginning to wonder if maybe she had married him for his money. So he asked her. He said, tell me the truth. If I lost all my money, would you still love me? And she said reassuringly, oh, honey, don't be silly. Of course I would still love you, and I would miss you terribly. <laughs> money can change your attitude and who you are as a person. I heard about a farmer that uh, called the church office asking to see the head hog at the trough. The receptionist said, excuse me? Sir, if you're talking about our minister, you can address him as our evangelist or as our preacher, but I don't think that you should ever call him the head hog at the trough. All right, the farmer said, but I had just sold a whole herd of livestock, and I was going to give $25,000 to the building fund, but only if I got to talk to the minister. And the receptionist said, just a moment, I think I see the big pig walking in right now. <laughs> Throughout the years, God has released great blessings when his children wholeheartedly follow him. And because you've seen already in your handouts, Malachi, maybe you're there. So turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And in verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now that's a great promise from Scripture, even if you don't have any barns or vats. Do you realize that this inspired promise from Proverbs still applies to us today? After all, this promise comes just three verses after a great promise back in verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. How many have seen that on a, uh, a billboard just recently? They've got them all over Grand Rapids. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. And since we can have confidence in our Father God to give us wisdom and guidance in our daily life, why not trust him completely with all the things that we have? Not just uh, 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 our, our families or our possessions, but put him first in our giving. Back to Malachi. This reveal, reveals how important tithing is to God. When his people refused to honor him, he accused them of robbing him. And this is how he phrases it in Malachi 3, beginning in verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you've turned aside from my statutes, have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, well, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I, did not, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. God's word says that when we obey him by tithing, he'll shower us with material blessings. But when they refuse to follow his wishes regarding their giving, the Bible says they fell under a curse. Sometimes Christians get swept up in a debate over whether or not we're required to tithe. I I've heard this forever. 
Well, that's Old Testament, Bruce. That's Old Testament. We don't live under the Old Testament. So are you sure that we're still required to tithe? Well, that's not the real question. The real question is, does the promise of this text still apply today? And I believe it does. Let me ask you a question. How many here believe that God will never destroy the whole earth with a flood again? Ha! Huh. I bet I know why. Turn over to Genesis chapter 9. I'll bet you that's why you believe that promise. Genesis chapter 9. Verses 12 through 16. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I'm making between me and you and every living creature that's with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a, for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. You ever seen a rainbow? That's God's sign. Not gay's sign. God was the author of the rainbow. And he put that there to remind us of this promise he made, I'm never going to flood the earth again. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh when the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. This promise didn't have to be restated in the New Testament in order to be valid. Just as the promise in Proverbs doesn't have to be restated in order to be valid. Our decision to give at least 10% of our income back to God reflects our reliance on Him as the source of our blessing. And that's the kind of faith that pleases God. Go back to Malachi 3 and verse 10 again. This text is not really a command. Certainly the Lord of heaven reserves the right to give orders. He deserves to be obeyed. But that's not the idea behind our text. He says, test me. Try it just once. Give it a try. The Lord invites his people to test, meaning an experiment. Now, some of you uh, might be thinking, wait a minute, Bruce. Doesn't the Bible say you're not supposed to test God? Deuteronomy 6.16. Remember Satan's got Jesus in the wilderness? And Jesus says to Satan, don't put the Lord your God to the test. So you're telling us that we're supposed to test God? That doesn't sound right. I thought we're not supposed to test God. Well, challenging God's authority is wrong. But this isn't what we're doing. God says, give me a chance. Try me. I'm reminded of a story about Robert Ingersoll. He was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln. Ingersoll was perhaps the most famous atheist of his day, and he traveled the country doing uh, rants and raves uh, against God and uh, how foolish people of faith were. He would ridicule the Bible, and large crowds would fill auditoriums because he was so entertaining when he spoke. One night after a particularly fiery talk about the foolishness of faith, Ingersoll took out his watch and he said with great pomp, I'm going to put God to the test right here. God, you got five minutes to strike me dead and prove that you're real. First there was silence. Now you got to remember, we're going back into the 1800s and people were much different than today. First there was stunned silence. And then people became uneasy and some of them even got up and ran out of the hall. One woman fainted. And finally after several minutes the atheist exclaimed, See? 
<laughs> I'm still very much alive. After the lecture, a young skeptic turned to a Christian lady seated next to him and said, well, old Ingersoll surly, certainly proved something tonight, didn't he? And that lady, quick as a blink, said, yes, he did. He proved God's not taking any orders from atheists tonight. <laughs> the test of Malachi 3 isn't a test of a doubtful heart. It's God challenging those that profess faith in him to get serious. And in this case, it's the Lord who's out to prove something. And he dares you to give him a chance to prove what you can never know except through personal experience. I mean, you can hear people testify, give testimonies about how giving has changed their life. You can hear people talk about how their lives have improved and what a difference it's made. But that's just hearing someone else's experience. The only way that you can experience what they're talking about is if you yourself do this. What does God want to prove? Well, first God wants to prove to you that he's the Lord of everything, not just the God of spiritual things. Most of you here today believe in God. The majority of you have made a commitment to Christ. You believe that God forgives sin, answers prayer, gives you strength for the tough times. But sometimes we stop right there and we act as if God leaves us the moment we walk out those doors. That he's about spiritual things, but not day-to-day -day living and tithing gives God an opportunity to prove that he has power even over the material. Now before I go any further, let me just uh, do an explanation here uh, about tithing. We're, we're talking about, um, it's an Old Testament vocabulary word, and it means a tenth part, a tenth. Sometimes people mistakenly think of it as being a generic term, and they're just talking about giving tithes and offerings, and what they mean is they're just giving something. It's, it's, a, it's a gift. And, and that's not correct. It meant a tenth part. So in the ancient world, you, you gave a tenth, and they didn't have checks and currency. They had animals and coins and kids. And that's why the men were always uh, never afraid once they'd had their ninth baby to have another one. Because they're just going to give that one away. No, I'm teasing. No, not really. I'm teasing. But if you had uh, 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 the tenth lamb was brought to the Lord. Uh, the tenth cow, the tenth donkey. Uh, uh, when you had uh, uh, sheaves of grain, the tenth one was given to the Lord. It was a tenth. It wasn't just a generic thing. And it's more complicated in our world, but no less practical. The practice of the tithe was intended to be more than just a convenient and proportionate way to calculate. Well, let me see. Let me do a little uh, Vesterberg cipher in here. I've got to get down to the point zero one. Yeah, that's right. If, if, if you're worried about getting it precisely at 10%, well, you've got bigger problems than that. Just round it off. You know, I've got a brother-in-law, I call him Tomcat. And Tomcat uh, doesn't go to church. Tomcat doesn't know the Lord. Tomcat doesn't know anything about blessing. His biggest blessing uh, was two years ago when he married my little sister because I became his brother-in-law. <laughs> That's the old blessing for Tomcat. And he's uh, been so happy that he's come into my family because everything I've got, he's got. Because I don't live there. He does. 
So John Rademacher and I went up this week, and I was happy to introduce him to Tomcat. And I was talking about Tomcat all the way up, and John kept saying, who's Tomcat? Who's... I said, my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law. I don't call him Tom, I call him Tomcat. Well, I, and I said, and you watch, as soon as we pull in, because Tomcat doesn't work. I said, as soon as we pull in, Tomcat's going to be up there, find out what's going on. Sure enough, we hadn't been there very long, and in comes Tomcat. And John says, he's here. I said, oh, yeah, I was expecting him. He says, what are you doing? I said, uh, we got a big storm coming. I'm taking my generators home. Oh. I thought I could use your generators because I don't have any. He inherited some money. I heard all about it because my sister had the audacity to spend some of it. I thought when you were married, you know, you just got those things together, but no, no. And as someone, uh, a close friend of mine said, yeah, Tomcat wasn't worried about buying a generator because he knows his brother-in-law's got one. He just takes it anytime he needs it. Well, I'm not heartless, regardless of what you think about me. And so I said, okay, I, I knew that. So here, I, I, this is a brand new generator. I just bought it from Sam's Club in October. I'm going to leave that. He says, I don't want that one. I want that one that's in your truck. I said, you can't have that one. Here, this is brand new. I don't want that one. I said, Tomcat, I can put that in my truck and take that one home too. I'll take it. When, when we put our faith in God, the, the blessings that he provides are, are just amazing. But when we are trying to do it on our own, even simple things become real crazy for us. And we have to worry about whether or not our in-laws are going to supply our needs. Because I wasn't put on this earth to supply Tomcat's needs. That's what God is for. You see? When we've got God in our life, that's who we depend on. Now, I'm telling you, I am so blessed by this congregation. People who just out of the blue say, we're bringing a meal. We're doing this. We're doing that. Not because I asked. But because God put it in your heart to do that. That's the difference between church people and people who don't know God. The God of heaven is the Lord of all, every part of your life. And God dares you to act like you believe that. And this can happen when you tie, but there's more. The second point, the Lord wants to prove he hasn't changed. Some people act as if God in the Old Testament did it this way, but God in the New Testament doesn't do that anymore. Oh yeah, we know he did that. Yeah, we know he did that, but that was then. He did miracles then. He doesn't do that now. Did you catch the opening line of our text in Proverbs? I, the Lord, do not change. Challenge God. Dare him to prove that he's still God. Stories of God's abundant supply fill the pages of the Bible. He fed the Hebrews with manna in the wilderness. Both Elisha and Elijah experienced miracles at the hand of God. The 23rd Psalm speaks of still waters and green pastures and overflowing cups for those the Lord shepherds. 
He turned water into wine. He took loaves and fish and blessed it so that it fed thousands. Last week's text said, remember this, God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound into every good work. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Most of you believe all that happened then. That's the easy part. But do you believe that God still provides for those who trust in him today? Because our text says God hasn't changed. One writer illustrates it this way. A church member was having trouble with the concept of tithing, and one day he revealed this struggle with the preacher. And the preacher said, or no, he said to the preacher, I, I Preacher, I just don't see how I can give 10% of my income when I can't make it now. I'm 100%. The preacher said, John, what if I promise to make up the difference in your bills if you fall short? You try tithing for 90 days. And if you come up short with your bills, I'll make up the difference. After a moment's pause, John said, uh, well, sure. If you promise to make up the difference, any shortage, then I'll give tithing a try. And the preacher said, now let me see if I get this right. You say you're willing to take my word, even though you know financially there is no way on this planet I can do that. But you won't take God's word, who has the storehouse of heaven as his resource. That's funny. When we accept God's dare to try the tithe, we give him an opportunity to prove that he is Lord of all. Given the chance, God loves demonstrating that he hasn't changed. He's just as powerful now as he's always been. You're going to experience a, th a third consequence. You hear how our text put the promise? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me, says God, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you'll not have room enough for it you will personally discover that God is the God of his word. You'll learn, for example, the truth of Jesus' statement, it's more blessed to give than to receive. J.L. Kraft, the founder of the giant Kraft Cheese Corporation, learned this. He was very wealthy and very generous. He regularly gave away 25% or more of his enormous income to Christian causes. And near the end of his life, he said, the only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I've given to the Lord. Martin Luther put it like this. I've held many things in my hands and lost all of them. But whatever I placed in God's hands, that I still possess. You'll also discover that tithing will never be any easier than it is right now. Yeah, preacher, this tithing thing, that sounds real intriguing. And someday I'm going to try it. I, I, I can't right now. I got, I got things, I got bills to pay. I remember a gentleman that was uh, a leader in this congregation. This was years ago. And we'd gone around the table in the elders' meeting, and we thought it would be a good idea. If we're going to start this tithing business, then the leaders ought to 
be first. I mean, how are we supposed to expect our people to tithe if we're not going to do it? So around the room he went. Man after man, some of them uh, needed uh, resuscitation. Some of them had to go into cardiac arrest and we had the paddles out trying to restore them. One man looked at me and he said, well, I like this idea. And I think we all should. But I just can't right now. I've got uh, uh, two car payments and a business that I've just started and I've got this and I've got that and kids going off to college. But I'll tell you something, preacher, as soon as I get all of that taken care of, I'm your man. He never got that taken care of. It's not said today, at least I don't hear it as much, but there was a long time ago when kids were thinking about getting married and parents and grandparents were real happy about the institution of marriage. And you'd hear these kids and they'd be talking at the youth group or they'd be talking at a potluck and old people would be around them and they'd say, well, we'd like to get married, but we're waiting until we can afford it. There was a, just an old phrase that <laughs> old timers would say. They'd say, listen, if you wait to get married until you can afford it, you're going to be single the rest of your life. And the same principle goes with having kids. You know, I was, we're thinking about having kids, but we thought we'd wait till we could afford it. Man, I tell you, our population would be zero if we waited until we could afford to have kids. It's the same with tithing. Rockefeller, one of the time the wealthiest man in the world, donated millions. He once said, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary of $1.50 a week. And finally, you'll learn that the Lord can make 90% go farther with his help than 100% without his involvement. A boy and his mom were in the drugstore. And uh, as she was doing her shopping, he had his eyes on one thing, and it was a great big jar of candy. And the owner saw the boy staring right through that jar. And when the mother went to pay, the owner said, uh, Son, would you like some of that candy? Duh! And he smiled and he said, Go ahead. Just take some. And he stood right there. And the owner said, I mean it. Go ahead. Just help yourself. And he stood right there. And the owner said, I'm serious, young fella. Just reach your hand right in there and grab some candy. Your mom doesn't have to pay for it. And he stood right there. Finally, the owner, he reached into that jar. He grabbed a whole bunch of candy. And that boy pulled his hands like that, and he just poured it in. And they left. And as they were going to the car, the mom looked at her son and said, what's wrong with you? He asked you three times if you would get some candy, and you, you didn't even answer him. That little guy, he smiled and he said, his hand was bigger than mine. <laughs> oh, I tell you, you're going to find that God's hands are bigger than yours. That's what tithing will prove. He wants to prove that his hands are bigger than yours. If there's an area in your life that you are continually defeated, this may be God's way of getting you to understand that until you come full bore, all on board, maybe the root problem you're having is your negligence to believe God's promises. That's what Malachi was trying to communicate. Listen, you're having problems because you're not trusting completely in God. 
a brilliant young electrical engineer. His life was in major trouble, and he wrote a letter to his preacher, and he shared his experience from this letter. And this is what he said. As you know, I came to this church a very hurting person. I carried burdens that left me completely helpless. I was existing, but not really living. Three years ago, I grew gravely ill and lost most of my physical strength and much of my immune system. At my lowest point, I literally crawled across my front lawn to get to my car because I was too weak physically to walk. I felt that I was dying and I was morbidly afraid of death, literally terrified of going to hell. Out of touch with God, I felt if I could just find another doctor, surely everything would get better. And then in desperation, because nothing was helping, and without asking for anything specific, I just cried out to God on that front lawn. I said, please, God, do something to let me know you're there. I was ready to do anything. Now I know that God was humbling me so that I would come to trust him more completely. I decided to go to church. And on my first visit to church, I was astonished because I felt comfortable here immediately. I felt a keen sense of the presence of God I had not felt that anywhere else. The preacher's sermons are always helpful, and this is a different church, of course. The preacher's sermons were always helpful. But the moment of truth came when he preached a sermon on stewardship, and he said, anyone that does not give back to God at least 10% is a thief. <laughs> I'd never even seriously thought of giving 10%. I couldn't imagine how in the world that could possibly fit into my budget. But the word thief hit me hard. And I now realize that I was so miserable because God was last on my list of priorities rather than first. So I asked him for forgiveness. And I pledged to give back 10% of my income for the rest of my life. It was the most important decision I've ever made. From that moment, things began to change dramatically for the better. The people who are closest to me have marveled at the changes in my life. Too many positive things have happened to be coincidence. Most obvious is my greatly improved health, which has been immediate. Most practical is that after looking for a job for three years, I found one, the best job I've ever had in my life. And most gratifying is the deep feeling of inner peace, which for the first time in my life I feel. I feel different on the inside than when I first came to see you. And everybody who knows me says I'm different on the outside too. Let faith take a hold of your heart and take a hold of God's promises. It's not a matter of whether or not you can tie. It's whether or not you can afford not to tithe. Because when you put him first, his promise is, I will take care of you. There isn't another person on this planet that can say that. Oh, we say it all the time. Oh, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. You know that's not true things happen. We have heart attacks. We lose our job. People that we depended on leave us alone. You can't put your faith in people because they're always going to disappoint. But when you put your faith in God, He never fails. So grab this hymn book. Turn to 571. Stand with me and blare out the song. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. When we do His good will, He abides with us still. And with all who will trust,
I know you were probably thinking with the uh, smaller attendance, the sermon wouldn't be so long. Sorry. If it hadn't been stewardship, I'd have let you out sooner. It reminds me of a story about an old uh, preacher in a rural community. There was a blizzard that took place. I mean to tell you, it was like last night's. He showed up at church and only one old codger trudged through that snow and was there. And the preacher looked around, he looked at that old codger and he said, wow, it's just you and me. You think I should just dismiss or should I preach the sermon? And that old timer thought, and he said, well, preacher, if I only had one cow make it into the barn, I'd feed her. So he opened his Bible and he started going. Man, he preached fervor. He was going crazy and he finished her up. He got all done. He looked at the old timer and he says, what do you think of that? That old timer said, well, if I only had one cow come in the barn, I wouldn't have given him the whole bale. <laughs> Would you pray with me, please? Father, this is such a wonderful time to be your children. When we are reminded again of where our faith is, it's in you. And a wonderful opportunity to show our faith and to, you to demonstrate your power. I pray that as we're thinking about these decisions in our giving and in our living, we might want to be good stewards of what you've provided for us. And for this fellowship that's going to transpire here in the next few moments, we're so thankful for Wade and for Maddie, bringing them into our fellowship. And I pray that as we gather around and converse with one another, that you would bless that fellowship as well. Dismiss us now with your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.